Our second reading is from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one ab who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to start out today by telling you a parable. There once was a young boy who wanted nothing more than to be like his father. From the day he could walk, he followed his dad around, emulating his every move. When his father made a cup of coffee in the morning, he would, he would pour milk into his own mug, pretending to sip something bitter. When his father pulled out his tools to fix something around the house, the boy was right there with his own playset, trying to learn how it was done. His mom even had to buy him a little suit because he wanted to look like his dad when they went to church on Sunday mornings. Of course, he couldn't tie his own tie yet, so his, his dad came over and he tied it for him. Look here. See, the big eagle circles the little rabbit round and around, and he flies up into the sky and down to catch the rabbit. The boy was so proud that day, sitting next to his dad in the pew, two peas in a pod. He beamed when the ladies at church remarked, oh, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, does it? Well, as time went, th as time, as time went on, the boy began to notice little differences between him and his father. He had his mother's hair, curly and rebellious, and his smile crooked where his father's was straight. He never quite reached his father's stature, and his tenor voice never dropped to match his father's deep baritone. There were little things that most people would never have noticed, but, but they bothered him, magnifying a disconnect between him and his father as he grew older. He eventually went out into the world, hoping to find his own identity where his father's shadow didn't reach. He slowly lost touch with his dad, not for any malicious reason, but simply because they drifted apart. A few years later, the boy's father had a sudden heart attack, and he passed away. It was a shock to everyone, and the whole community came together for the funeral. The church was packed full that day of people in suits and dresses. And the boy flew home to be with his family, but he felt apprehensive about seeing his father for the last time. He knew that he would never measure up to the man that he was. Well, during the visitation before the service, he noticed that one of his nephews was struggling in the corner. Evidently, his parents had forced him into a suit that he didn't want to wear, and he was tugging it to pieces. So the son walked over to him, got down on one knee, put his hand on his shoulder. Let me help you. Do you know how to tie a tie? And his nephew shook his head, no. Well, let me show you. you. See, the big eagle circles around the little rabbit, round and around, and he flies up into the sky and then down to catch the rabbit. There you go, buddy. And he patted him on the back and sent him on his way. When he stood up and turned around, he was surprised to see his mother standing behind him. What? Oh, it's nothing. You just looked like your father, that's all. 
Today we're talking about family resemblance. Family is very important to the biblical story. The entire Old Testament is about one family turned nation that comes from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Israelites. Two of the Gospels even have genealogies of Jesus, so you can trace back his, his family lineage. But Jesus isn't just concerned about blood relations. The way he tells it, Jesus came here to grow God's family through those who are born again of water and the Spirit, and those who are adopted into God's family to become children by grace. Through his death on the cross, Jesus earned for all people the right to be called children of God. And through his resurrection, Jesus charted a path forward for all of God's children as the firstborn of the new creation. The gospel is about incorporation into God's family. Now, in our epistle reading, one of Jesus' original followers, the Apostle John, expounds on this image to make this point. If we are children of God, then we are called to look like our Father in heaven. But as you heard in the parable earlier, family resemblance isn't what you look like. It's what you do. The boy resembled his father when he did what his father did, when he cared like his father cared. That's what it's like for us, too. We resemble our heavenly father when we love like he loves and we act like he acts. God even sent us an example, his own son, to show us what a true child of God does. Jesus sought out the needy and healed and helped them. He forgave sins and restored outcasts. He called disciples to follow him on the narrow path. And as John reminds us, Jesus was without sin. That's the, that's the family trait of God's family, righteousness. And by righteousness, I mean being on the right side, the side of, of light and not darkness, the side of truth and not lies, the side of love and not hate. The question is, which side are we on? Children of God act like their brother, Christ. They avoid sin like he does. John even says, no one who abides in him, that's Christ, keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Well, that's a pretty high bar. Well, by this, John doesn't mean that believers never sin at all. Remember last week, Pastor Rod preached on 1 John 1, where he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Being on the side of truth means confessing that we have sin. It means acknowledging the times and places where we have not acted according to God's good will for us as his children. But what John means when he says that no one who abides in Christ keeps on sinning is that they do not live in their sins. They don't set up camp there and say, oh, well, well, God loves me no matter what, so I, I might as well do this. That would be walking in darkness. Those who walk in darkness are not children of God, but children of his enemy, the devil. Family resemblance, you see. It isn't what you look like. It's what you do. Like father, like son, like dad, like daughter, has the apple fallen far from the tree? Do you bear a resemblance to your heavenly father? Does the way you live your life look like Christ's life? John challenges us to wrestle with these questions today. And I think that a good, honest look at ourselves reveals that we don't bear as much family resemblance as we would like. Maybe it's the occasional sin that you just can't kick. You aren't aiming to sin, but somehow you still come back here every Sunday with something to confess. Or maybe you're looking around and realizing that you are living in the dark. You probably didn't set out to do this, but you're on the wrong side of things now. Sin has become your life, part of 
who you are, part of what you love, part of what you do. No matter which one you think you are today, I have another parable that I'd like to tell you. There once was a young man who wanted nothing to do with his father. He told his father that he wished that he was dead and demanded the money that was coming to him when he died, his inheritance. And with a sad shake of his head, the father gave his son the money and he went on his way, eager to chart his own path. And in a faraway country, he spent that money doing everything that his father had taught him not to do. He recklessly squandered what he had until there was nothing left. And then a severe famine rose up in that country and he found himself in need. And with no other option, he went and he hired himself out to, to feed pigs out in the fields. And he was so hungry that the slop the pigs ate began to look appetizing to him, but no one gave him anything. At this point, the young man realized, even the servants in my father's house are doing better than I am. What if I go back to my father and I say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Maybe he will at least pity me. So he began the long trek home. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him in the distance and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he is found. What does this parable, which was originally told by Jesus, have to teach us about Family resemblance. In this parable, the son didn't look anything like his father. In fact, he rejected his father and everything that he stood for. He walked in darkness. But a part of him still remembered, a part of him still remembered what the light looked like. So he went home, not quite sure what he would find. But what he found was a father who embraced him like the son he was. He must have been unrecognizable from that journey, and yet the father knew. There wasn't a hint of, of shaming or chastisement in his voice. What he felt was love and joy that his son had returned. That's how God the Father is with us. It's not our behavior that makes us children of God. It is God's love for us which caused him to send his son that whoever believes in him can be called a child of God. It is that love which purifies us, just as Christ is pure. Christ's death on the cross and resurrection from the dead have made us righteous before God. We have that family trait. When God looks at us, he sees the sinless perfection of his own son, Jesus Christ. He sees us as righteous. And so we are. To God, you are his treasured child, his beloved son or daughter. You are the apple of his eye. The apple that has not fallen far from the tree. So is family resemblance something that you do? Or is it something that you're given? Yes, it's both, but in different ways. Your identity as a child of God, your resemblance to Christ in the eyes of God is given to you by grace, like the father in the parable of the prodigal son. No matter what you look like, no matter what you've done, God is always overjoyed to welcome you home as his own child. John is then encouraging us to act like the sons and the daughters that we are. He's encouraging us to adopt that family trait of righteousness for ourselves, to live before the world as representatives of Christ. And none of that makes us worthy to be children of God. We already are because of Christ. 
But because of what Christ has done, and because of the Holy Spirit who, who lives within you, you can start to look more and more like your family, even now. And one day, you will. John says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we, sh we shall see him as he is. When Christ returns, we will become like him fully. We will have complete family resemblance, both in the eyes of God and in the eyes of the world. We will finally act like the children that we already are. Until then, we're practicing righteousness. And I do mean practicing. I may not be much of a sports guy, but I do remember going to all those practices when I was a kid. We'd run soccer drills for hours. Sometimes it was monotonous or exhausting or even frustrating. I just wanted to play the game. But you don't jump into the match and expect to win. You have to practice because that's how you become what you hope to be. The future, the big game, shaped what we did in the now, the drills. In the same way, our future as perfected children of God means that we should practice righteousness now. You practice for what you hope to be. So we don't want to practice sin because we don't hope to be sinners. We hope to be righteous children of God. So instead, we practice righteousness, being on the right side, the side of light, the side of truth, the side of love, the side of Christ. And when that future comes, we will look like our Father who is in heaven. After all, God is not done with us yet, and he never gives up on his children. In Jesus' name, amen.